Cherry really is absolutely wonderful to work with. It smells nice, it cuts well, it's soft but not too soft, and the grain is very unique. And this giant cherry hutch is going to need a lot of it. I also added a lot of new challenges like arc top glass doors, solid cherry drawers, and even some turn legs that give it a nice traditional charm. A lot of this project is going to be solid cherry, but I still like using veneered plywood for the cabinet boxes, and these sheets of three quarter are never easy to wrestle around. I am very grateful for my large space though. It makes moving these things much easier, and I know most of you won't have that much space to work in. And believe me, I know how it is. If you've been with this channel for a while, you probably remember that I started in a single car garage. And if there's one thing I learned during those six years, it's defying the odds. You absolutely can do it, no matter how much space you have or what people say. And I know some of this content is going to be pretty advanced, and most of my builds are, but I promise I will teach you a lot along the way, and you will leave this video a much better woodworker. To give you a quick overview of this build, let's start with the model. The lower drawer unit will have turned legs that copy the customer's current vanity. A 22 inch deep box will have curved skirting and six drawers that also have the same profile as the vanity drawers. A thick cherry top will have plenty of strength to hold the heavy upper hutch. Each door will be a part of an overarching arc top look with high quality frosted glass. Crown molding will seal the deal and we are in business. I chose three quarter cherry veneered plywood for all of the box panels because this thing is going to be pretty dang heavy by the end, especially when the customer loads the hutch up with bricks or whatever you load a hutch up with. And I guess in this case, it may be clothes or towels because this thing is going in a very large bathroom closet. That's why everything is designed to fit well with the current vanity. So I cut the sides of the lower and upper cabinet out of the same sheet of plywood. That way, on the same side, the grain is continuous. So I know this guy looks like a goober, but he really knows a thing or two about consistency. If all of the exterior facing sheets are cut from the same sheet of plywood, we have a pretty great chance in knowing that they will all have a good match in grain and color. It's small details like this that will set your work apart from the other guys or gals. I recently decided to switch the size of shelf pins that I use, but they don't sell jigs for these three millimeter holes. But look at the drastic difference between the sizes of these. The three millimeter holes are practically invisible inside of the cabinet, unlike the quarter inch monsters. And yes, they are plenty strong for an adjustable shelf. There are a few things I should warn you about with cherry. When you expose cherry to the sun or any UV light, it darkens rather quickly. And after leaving this out for just a few hours, you have another reminder to subscribe if you want to keep learning. So this light band came from the ratchet strap when I tied these sheets down to my truck. They were only in the sunlight for 45 minutes, and the only way to get rid of it is by sanding it off or UV darkening the whole thing evenly. So avoid working outside with this wood because it will likely get all sorts of patterning on it. The only dado I didn't do is the middle divider in both cabinets. I just don't ever see a structural reason. So after marking where I want the panel to go, I can glue and screw it on. This is the base cabinet and building it face down on a flat table gives me the chance to assemble the backside, knowing that the front is all flush. The back in this case is two pieces because it saves me from buying another sheet of quarter inch ply. I also don't glue my backs on because there have been a few times where I've needed to pull the back to re-square the cabinet. So screws or staples are a lot easier to pull. Adding these poplar glue blocks to the bottom of the cabinet will offer a sturdy mounting location for the legs that we will eventually be turning. I make sure to use plenty of glue and shoot brad nails into the corners, avoiding the areas that the legs will screw into. The upper cabinet is assembled the same exact way, but without glue blocks. I do add protective feet though, so I don't damage the plywood edges as I move it around. And here we go again, doing everything myself since I think I'm so freaking independent.
The next step is to get some various glue ups done so that they can start curing over the next few days. I start with basically rough sawn material so I can straighten everything, but you can just as easily buy lumber that has been pre-serviced on three or four sides and skip this milling process. I have learned that getting a straight edge before milling the faces is a lot smarter of an approach, because now I can take that straight edge to the table saw and rip my boards a quarter inch wider than needed, then I can safely cut them all to rough length on a miter saw, giving myself a couple extra inches. For the countertop, I bought 12 foot boards so I can cut them into six foot pieces each. So this long miter saw setup is really helpful in this case. It's one of my most popular videos for dead simple cabinetry without complicated techniques and dados. I surfaced a lot of the boards off camera and now they are ready to be jointed for gluing. I really try my best to get very tight joints, and I only use glue on one surface on edge joints because the fit is so precise. No dominoes here. This thick stock is easy enough to keep level with some clamps at the ends. It took me six years to figure out that using a drywall knife is perfect for cleaning up the squeeze out. Six years. For the turn legs, I'm laminating a thick block together for a blank. I do use light glue on both mating surfaces for face glue ups because that large of a surface area sometimes is hard to get good squeeze out if only one side is glued. And whoops, I just stuck the wrong side which isn't jointed, so I have to clean it off and glue the correct side. By the way, these three layers are from the same board so that the color and grain matches, of course and getting these glue ups done now will give them ample time to dry. So why is it so important for the boards to have good drying time? And you may think it's for strength and we actually get full strength from yellow glues around the 12 or 24 hour mark. So no, it's actually due to the different expansion rates of each board. If we create our final objects before the board has reached equilibrium again, meaning it's back to whatever ambient moisture level it was before the glue, then each board could shrink at a different rate, creating visual lines where the joints are. And we want this to look like one solid block, not several boards after finish goes on. The face frame rails and styles can be cut on a table saw. The easiest way I've found to space them perfectly is with spacer blocks. Then I can mark for dominoes. These do need dados in several locations to mount correctly to the boxes. The dominoes can be mortised, then everything can be glued together. I offset some of the dominoes to the side so I can also drill a few pocket holes from the back side. Especially on longer face frames, it makes it easier if a few screws can pull things nice and tight rather than relying on super long clamps. And cleaning the inside corners with a wet brush works like a charm. The upper cabinet frame is assembled in the same fashion. Sometimes I like pulling the joint tight with one clamp, then adding another clamp to hold it, then releasing the first clamp to make room to drive the screw while completely blocking the camera. I also made a mistake on this frame and I'm about to realize it at the weirdest time. The boards for the doors and drawer faces can be final milled. This is a lengthy process but results in stunningly straight boards. Oh, and there it is. That, my friends, is the face of a poor man that just realized his mistakes. And the thing I goofed up is pretty simple. The middle style on the upper cabinet needs to support two doors, not one. And since each door overlays one and three eighths, the style needs to be three inches wide, not an inch and a half. Luckily, the fix is pretty simple thanks to this lovely tool that every woodworker really should own. A quick and easy cut with a track saw on either side gets rid of the wrong style. Then the wider one can be slipped into place and pocket hole screwed from the back side.
Now, thankfully, we can all sleep at night. By now, the boards for the doors have been acclimating overnight, so we can get ready for profiling. Using tables on wheels is handy to transfer them to each tool while keeping them organized. First up is the grooving bit, which doesn't have to be the case. You can do the tenons first. I grooved the lower rails of the arc top doors, but not the upper large rails yet. I used to use feather boards on my router tables thinking they would create more consistent results, but honestly, a couple of these bench dogs push pads is all I need for great control. And look at how close you were to getting in my way. I've shown many ways on how to do the math to find the rail length that you want, and here's yet another way. Take your final width you want, then minus the width of the inside of the styles, and there's your number. Now the rails can be cut to final length and sent through the tenoning bit. To support the side without the groove, I think it's smart to add a sacrificial board to the miter gauge. But nope, watch this. Dude! Then I proceed to act calm and collected here, even though I practically lost a bowel movement and a finger in the process. Dude! Can we at least get a slow-mo of that? Yikes, the router table is such a dangerous tool, especially when the person using it is being stupid. I am adding tenons to the larger rails for the doors. The grooves will be added after we shape them into the arc. Another scary bit is this massive three inch raised panel bit. This will obviously create the raised panels for the drawer faces. Several passes have to be taken since so much material is being hogged off at once. Here are the first two passes. The last pass ensures that the edge of the panel will fit deeply into the frame's grooves. To match the profile of the current vanity, I also have to make a pass with this 60 degree V groove bit. This makes the raised panel have a bit more dimension. I can also use the same V groove bit to clean up the inside edges of the frame grooves, doing a stop cut on the styles and full length cut on the rails. Before everything is glued together, it's much easier to sand the profiles of everything now. Whenever I'm gluing a stain grade or clear coat project, I'm making sure I keep track of all traces of the glue. If I use too much and get a ton of squeeze out to clean up, chances are I will leave glue staining behind, and when finish is applied, this exposes the ugly staining. So I use just enough glue and clean up well with a damp rag. The floating panel has room to expand and contract, but I want it to be centered. And of course, every other drawer face went absolutely smoothly, but this one that I decided to film is being a pain in the you know what. Now after all of that commotion, I can pin it in the middle to keep it captive in the center. Several areas on the hutch have curved profiles, and the easiest way to make them consistent is with a template. But instead of using a CNC, I hand make my templates by marking them out on MDF and shaping them on my various sanders. And speaking of handmade, my new Patreon members will be receiving a handmade, one-of-a-kind gift made personally by me, because the first 20 patrons that support Fortress deserve a little extra thank you. If you haven't already checked it out, go to Patreon slash Fortress Fine Woodworks because I made some pretty unique tiers and I've already been communicating with some of my awesome new members. Thank you for your support. I know it may seem salesman-y to promote a Patreon, but truthfully, all I want is to provide more benefits to viewers and utilize your support to make better videos. So just know that it's all an honest attempt for better production quality. With the oversized door rails dry fit and lined up, I can mark the arc with the template I just made. Then it's easy enough to pull the rails, rough cut them on the bandsaw, and refine on the spindle sander. You can also use a flexible sanding block to sneak up on the line. 
Then with the arc finished, I can route the groove making sure I face the front side towards the table. On an inside curve, routing a profile sometimes leaves a little section that has to be chiseled and sanded. And I can't use the V groove on these curved pieces, so sanding will ease the edges. Then the back can be dadoed out because these doors will have glass, not a floating panel. And if this isn't making sense, I'll show you. I designed the doors so that I can order all of the glass panels at the same size, and instead of custom ordering them to have an arced top, it just makes sense to dado everything out so that it's a rectangle. The styles also have to be dadoed, but this has to be a stop cut, so I set up lines on the fence to dictate my start and stop positions, and I can slowly make the cut. To finalize the cut, I made a little jig for a small templating bit to follow. It sure is relaxing when the rain sets the mood and the shop is quiet. Nothing but the sound of rain, thunder, and the clicking of clamps. It's times like these that I've learned to appreciate. The glass will eventually be siliconed in to reduce noise and vibration, but I also want to make some decorative trim that holds it captive in the frame. I start with these little half moons, then rip them into little miniature quarter round molding. Now the doors are dry and it's time to square up the corners of the rabbits. I almost always make my doors oversized so I can cut them to final dimension afterward and fix any out of square issues I may have. This is definitely a trick I wish I knew when I was first starting out. The frames can be flush sanded in the drum sander easy enough, then the hinge pockets can be drilled. Since these doors have an arc, I had to make absolute sure that I was drilling the correct hinge side of every door. Which was a little weird on the inside doors since the arc makes my brain think that the hinges should be on this side, when they actually need to be on this side. Well that will end the steps for this video, I actually tried jamming all of it into one, but it would have been over 45 minutes, and that's just too long. So in the next video, we will turn and mount the legs, box joint six solid cherry drawers, and deck this thing out in a ton of trim. But before you go, here's a little sneak peek of some final shot action. <laughs> Sorry, Netflix kicked me off my family plan, so I'm getting used to this new remote. Toby oh, stepped directly in my eye. Sorry. These are some weird channels. Mom, I said I can't be cool if you put that on. You can subscribe by clicking on the left icon and here's another awesome video to watch.